Now coming to imaging, these are all the different things that you will be able to see. So either you may be able to find a cavity or you may be able to find these areas of nodular bronchiectasis or tree in bud appearance. So these are the three patterns which are generally seen in chest imaging, tree in bud pattern, nodular bronchiectasis and cavity formation. So uh, lingular involvement and right middle lobe involvement is something that is more commonly seen in patients with non-tuberculous mycobacterial infection. And when they do have an advanced disease, they may go on to develop bronchiectasis or a cavity. So remember, initially may start off as tree in bud appearance, involves more and more of the middle lobes uh, in the right and the lingular lobe in the left. And it goes on to develop cavities and nodular bronchiectasis. So coming to diagnosis, so currently what is recommended to make a diagnosis of non-tuberculous mycobacterial infection? So we require growth of these non-tuberculous mycobacteria in at least two out of three sputum samples to make a diagnosis of pulmonary NTM based on sputum culture alone. Now, if you are going to make a, a diagnosis based on a bowel culture, then just a single sample is enough. Growth of NTM from a single bowel sample is enough to make a diagnosis of pulmonary NTM. Or if you are planning to make a diagnosis of pulmonary NTM from the histopathology, you need these granulomas on the histopathology, you need to have sputum FB smear being positive and growth of NTM on cultures. So this is the 1, 2, 3 rule. So remember, so growth of NTM on any one bowel sample is enough to make a diagnosis of pulmonary NTM. Growth of uh, NTM on at least 2 out of 3 sputum samples is required to make a diagnosis of pulmonary NTM. And if you are planning to make a diagnosis from histopathology, you need 3 components. You need histopathology, you need sputum smear AFB positive and you need the sputum culture to be positive to make a diagnosis of pulmonary NTM. Now additionally, remember to test for clarithromycin susceptibility and rifampicin susceptibility. Particularly when you are dealing with MAC, it is very important we check for clarithromycin susceptibility. And for Kansasi, remember Kansasi is a lot like TB, uh, even with respect to the disease it causes, right? Therefore, just like how rifampicin is a backbone of TB treatment, so it is for Kansasi. So whenever you are dealing with Kansasi, always check for rifampicin resistance and MAC. Remember M for M. So for MAC infection, always check for and then finally drug susceptibility testing. So two important drugs we need to screen for resistance. One is clarithromycin and the other is rifampicin. Now we all know Mycobacterium Kansasi behaves a lot like tuberculosis with respect to the disease it causes. So just like how rifampicin is an important backbone of ATT, so it is for management of Kansasi as well. So when you have Kansasi, always check for rifampicin resistance. That is clear. Now coming to MAC, remember for MAC, remember MAC, macrolide, both are rhyming, right? So macrolide is an important part of the regimen against MAC. And MAC ends with C. So which macrolide are you going to test for? The macrolide that starts with C. So clarithromycin susceptibility is something that you will test for when you are dealing with a MAC infection. Now that brings us to management of these non-tuberculous mycobacterial infections. So as I said, for MAC infection, you will use a macrolide-based regimen along with two other ETT drugs. So you will use REM. So REM stands for rifampicin, ethambutol and macrolide. Remember, the macrolides which can be used in the management of MAC are going to be clarithromycin and azithromycin. So MAC, macrolide, what is the backbone of uh, MAC management, it is going to be macrolide. So you will add rifampicin and ethambutol to a macrolide which is going to be either clarithromycin or azithromycin. Pulmonary MAC may be treated three times a week but uh, disseminated MAC generally requires daily treatment. Similarly, patients who have a severe pulmonary MAC require daily treatment. And how long do we generally treat these patients with non-tuberculous mycobacterial infections? We generally treat them for up to 12 months after culture negativity. So from the time they become culture negative, from that point you will calculate a 12 month period. Now if you cannot use one of these drugs, then alternative medications which are going to be active against MAC include aminoglycosides, fluoroquinolones and clofazimin. Now coming to Kansasi, Kansasi is just like TB, remember that. So we are going to use all the first line ATT drugs except Z, except pyrazinamide. So HRE till culture negative for at least one year after culture negativity. So you will give HRE till one year after culture negativity. Here again, the alternatives are going to be fluoroquinolone, uh, aminoglycoside and clarithromycin. So macrolide is a good alternative for Kansasi, but the first line treatment is going to be HRE. So remember for MAC, it is going to be the macrolide based REM regimen 
for kansa seat is going to be the hre regimen now what about rapid growers rapid growers are generally treated with a macrolide and with an iv medication so this parenteral drug could be amikacin could be carbapenem or tigecycline so remember you give mac and you give iv act what is act a stands for aminoglycoside c stands for carbapenem and t stands for tigecycline so any one of these parenteral drugs along with mac is what you use to manage these rapid growing mycobacterial infections which includes afc abscesses fortuitum and chelone now alternatives again here includes uh, fluoroquinolone linezolid and doxycycline coming to marinum marinum is going to be treated just like mac with rem regimen but usually treated for a shorter duration so uh, all these skin and soft tissue infections may be treated for a slightly shorter duration so till 2 months after clinical resolution alternatives includes cortimoxazole doxycycline and minocycline other non tuberculous mycobacterial infections are all largely manageable with uh, macrolide and aminoglycoside all treated till a few months after clinical resolution now what is the recent uh, itsa guidelines say so uh, in 2020 the itsa the infectious disease society of america they came up with the guidelines for managing patients with pulmonary non tuberculous mycobacterial infections so here macrolide based triple drug regimen is what is advocated and which macrolide has to be preferred so itsa says azithromycin is preferred to clarithromycin because of fewer interactions therefore the regimen could be either Uh, rifampicin etambutol or macrolide or you can also use rifampicin etambutol and aminoglycoside where macrolide cannot be used but you will largely make use of a macrolide based triple drug regimen so remember for mac the drug of choice is going to be r e m you use a macrolide based triple drug regimen which macrolide azithromycin is preferred if you cannot use r e m then you will use r e and aminoglycoside now as i mentioned earlier when you have less severe pulmonary mac with non cavitary disease then you can treat them with thrice a week treatment if you have a more severe or an advanced mac pulmonary mac then you will have to treat them with daily antibiotics generally the duration of treatment is 12 till 12 months after culture negativity and what is the role of aminoglycoside so when will you use this reag regimen so only when patients have a severe bronchiectatic or a cavitary disease when patients are going to be macrolide resistant and whenever they have failed the at least 6 months of standard therapy so in such instances we can make use of aminoglycoside there is also an amino an amikacin liposomal inhalation suspension so this in, inhaled aminoglycoside is something that is approved for use in patients who have failed treatment So keep this in mind. Itsa currently says for MAC you make use of the macrolide based triple drug regimen. So R E M is going to be the regimen of choice. You treat these patients till twelve months after culture negativity. Now those with a less severe disease with non cavitary pulmonary MAC can be treated with three days a week of antibiotic therapy. Uh, the rest of the people with more severe or advanced disease cavitary MAC all require. daily treatment with uh, rem antibiotics now when will you use this regimen r e a g so when will you make use of aminoglycoside when they have a severe bronchiectatic or a cavitary disease when we cannot give m so when we cannot use the macrolide either because of macrolide allergy macrolide intolerance or a contraindication to macrolide and uh, similarly or when they have failed at least 6 month period of standard therapy So when there is treatment failure it is preferable that we use inhaled formulation of aminoglycoside like the amikacin liposomal inhalation suspension now coming to kansasi kansasi is a lot like tb so if they are going to be rifampicin susceptible then we are usually going to treat them with hre or we can also resort to rem now rem is something that can be given in non cavitary disease as 3 days a week therapy but in cavitary disease or in patients with severe kansasi pulmonary disease you will have to give it as a daily treatment so only with this rem regimen only when you use a macrolide this 3 days a week treatment is going to be possible be it for kansasi or for mac but remember it has to be a less severe fairly early non cavitary pulmonary disease now whenever you have a cavitary or a severe disease when you using rem you will have to give daily treatment 
similarly in kansasi whenever you're using the other regimen whenever you're using hre regimen then again you will have to give only daily treatment so keep in mind this thrice a week treatment is only when you use the rem regimen and only when the disease is much less severe now what is the role of second line drugs in the management of kansasi so as i said rifampicin is a backbone of att similarly for kansasi treatment also rifampicin is the backbone so whenever there is rifampicin intolerance or rifampicin resistance we can make use of second line drugs these second line drugs include fluoroquinolone and aminoglycoside so we can make use of quinolone ethambutol and macrolide so instead of rem when there is rifampicin resistance we can replace the rifampicin with quinolone so that is one combination but remember in this combination both quinolones and macrolides have a qt prolonging uh, potential so keep that in mind and both can interact next will be um, severe disease so in whenever patients have a severe disease then in addition to rem or in addition to hre you can add on either a fluoroquinolone or an aminoglycoside so that is going to be possible so only two indications for adding on fluoroquinolone or aminoglycoside in kansasi infections one is going to be rifampicin resistance or intolerance and the other is going to be a severe disease here again like back we are going to treat them for up to 12 months after they become culture negative how about mycobacterium zoonopy again here we have the macrolide based triple drug daily regimen or we can also use moxiflox in place of macrolide so for most of these infections we've been learning so far we've been learning the rem regimen so rifampicin ethambutol and macrolide only difference here instead of macrolide you can also give moxifloxacin or in addition to macrolide in addition to rem you can also give moxifloxacin that is the only thing that you need to remember about mycobacterium zoonop so zoonop remember you can make use of moxifloxacin in addition to the routine rem regimen so role of aminoglycosides is usually only when there is going to be drug resistance or when there is going to be a severe disease all of these patients with pulmonary non tuberculous mycobacterial infections they will have to be they will have to be treated for at least 12 months after they become culture negative and uh, when you look at these rapid growers like mycobacterium abscesses here again you will have to treat them with triple drug regimen but remember what i said earlier about treating skin and soft tissue infections with these rapid growers usually we treat them for a shorter duration so pulmonary infections with uh, these rapid growers the duration is not very clear but by and large most of the pulmonary non tuberculous mycobacterial infections are currently recommended to be treated for at least 12 months after culture negativity now what is the role of surgical resection so surgical resection is done only when there is going to be any bleeding cavity disease drug resistance extensive bronchiectasis or failure of medical treatment so usually we remember a b c d e because it's easier so this time the indications for surgical resection in pulmonary non tuberculous mycobacterial infections are going to be b c d e f we skip the a so b stands for bleeding which is severe hemoptysis c stands for cavity extensive cavity d stands for drug resistance drug is not working e stands for extensive disease extensive bronchiectasis and f stands for failure of medical management so these are the indications for surgical resection in pulmonary entia that brings us to prophylaxis before we wrap up this session so how do we prevent pulmonary entium so that brings us to prophylaxis with which we are going to be wrapping the session so we have three major options for uh, prophylaxis against entium infections this is particularly useful in advanced hiv infection when the cd4 count is as low as less than 50 so in hiv patients with cd4 count less than 50 these are the patients who are at a very high risk for disseminated entium infections and they will have to be on entium prophylaxis now for entium prophylaxis we have three options one is going to be a weekly azithromycin given at a dose of 1.2 grams next is going to be a daily clarithromycin given at a dose of 1 gram and the third is going to be daily rifabutin given at a dose of 300 mg so we have three options for prophylaxis against entium infections in patients with advanced hiv indication cd4 less than 50 and three options weekly azithromycin daily clarithromycin and daily rifabutin so now we have come to the end of this session i am just going to suggest this rule of 3 which is going to help us to quickly remember and recall all the important points that we have learnt so far about the non tuberculous mycobacteria in this session so we have two broad groups of non tuberculous mycobacteria that is something that we all know 
Now, but in each of these groups, we have three important components. So, in the slow growers, we have three subgroups. One is the photochromogens where they produce pigment in light. So, two important photochromogens, one is going to be Kansasi and the other is going to be Marinum. Now, next you have these scotochromogens which produce pigment in the dark. So, scoto, remember, this is where your mycobacterium strophilaceum features in and this is an important cause for lymphadenitis. Then you have achromogens which is a third group where there is no pigment formation as the name suggests. Important achromogens are mycobacterium ulcerans and MAC complex. You have three important rapid growers. You have AFC, you have abscesses, you have fortivitum and you have chelone. Three important sites which are often involved in non-tuberculous mycobacterial infection, most commonly lung, most common in children lymph nodes and then most commonly caused by the rapid growers which is the skin and soft tissue. And of course, in patients with advanced uh, immunosuppression, you may have disseminated disease as well. Now, three important risk factors for disseminated disease. Number one, HIV. Number two, anti-TNF alpha treatment. And number three, some mutation in the interferon gamma IL-12 pathway. Three important risk factors for pulmonary NTM infection. Number one, bronchiectasis. Number two, COPD. Number three, pulmonary alveolar proteinosis. Three important named syndromes caused by non-tuberculous mycobacteria. Number one, Lady Windermere syndrome, which is caused by MAC. This is a pulmonary disease characterized by nodular bronchiectasis in tall, thin, older, non-smoking females with some chest wall abnormality and valvular abnormality like mitral valve prolapse. Second one is a fish tank granuloma, which is a nulceronodular lesion seen in patients exposed to an aquatic environment. This is caused by Mycobacterium marinum. And then you have the Burley ulcer, which is an ulcer that develops in tropics, often following insect bites because of infection by Mycobacterium ulcerans. Then three important ways to diagnose non-tuberculous mycobacterial infection. Remember the 1-2-3 rule. So, one bowel culture being positive for NTM, two out of three sputum cultures being positive for NTM and three is you need to have three things being positive when the histopathology shows granuloma. So, histopathology, sputum smear, AFB and culture growing NTM. So, any one of these criteria positive, then you have a patient with NTM disease. Three important drugs in the management of non-tuberculous mycobacterial infections. Remember REM, rifampicin, ethambutol and macrolide. Macrolide is a very, very important drug for most of these non-tuberculous mycobacteria. Second line agents include aminoglycoside and fluoroquinolone. And three important prophylactic options in patients with advanced HIV. When CD4 is less than 50, weekly azithromycin, daily clarithromycin, daily rifabutin. And with this, we've come to the end of this session on non-tuberculous mycobacterial infections. I hope this has been helpful. Thank you. This is Dr. Aditi for Ra Online.